at the start of Lent, I'm reminded of the person, and I'm sure we've all met him or her over the years. The person who says, well, for Lent, I'm giving up smoking, or I'm giving up chocolate biscuits, or swearing, or whatever it be. And you might ask them, well, what did you give up last year? And the answer is the same. I've given it up year after year, all of my life. At which point you begin to ponder whether there isn't some sort of disconnect between this Lenten observance and the wider journey, the wider pilgrimage they're making. Although nowadays our Lenten observance may be quite trivial in the sense of giving up some small uh, treat, nevertheless that in a way signals our attitude towards our lives as a whole. And it's a great shame if we don't make the most of this wonderful gift of Lent. So at the start of this Lent, I'd just like to think a little bit about how we might integrate uh, this, this holy season with our lifelong pilgrimage, our lifelong journey to God and with God. Now for uh, our Mass, our Eucharist, um, we had a choice of two Gospel readings. Uh, and I chose this year the reading from John's Gospel uh, of the woman taken in adultery. The alternative reading is from Matthew's Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and Jesus' instructions about prayer, almsgiving and fasting. And of course those are well worth reading and reflecting on as well. But the story of the woman caught in adultery had such an impact uh, and seemed so relevant to our own Lenten journeys um, that I chose that and I'd like to say a little bit about it. There are some parallels which come to mind when we think about her and her accusers and the people who later on would accuse Jesus. We think forward, if you like, to, towards the end of Lent to Holy Week um, and Jesus' own trial. Very different in many ways, but one or two key similarities. Like Jesus, the woman is silent before her accusers. In her case, she has no defence. What can she say? We're told that she was caught in the very act. In Jesus' case, he's silent not because he has no defence, but really because there is no case to answer. It's a very clear uh, contrast between his situation and ours and our responsibility for our lives. And again, they're both victims of a sort of mob justice and, uh, and a procedural wrongdoing. This woman has been dragged into the street uh, no proper court to uh, oversee uh, the charges and, and the punishment, uh, the sentence. And in indeed, we know that Jesus' trial um, was uh, an illegal one, uh, a nighttime trial. So in her case, her life, despite this um, awful um, kangaroo court, as it were, her life is spared. Whereas after his illegal trial, of course, Jesus gives up his life. His life is surrendered. The story is powerful in many ways, and I'm sure we react very strongly to the sense of injustice uh, in this um, behaviour of the mob. There seems to be hypocrisy at play, and there's also um, a sense of the sexism of then and now. Um, there has been this act of adultery, and we hear about the woman as the perpetrator. We hear nothing of the man. Um, where is he? What sort of punishment is he being given? Has he been protected? Of course, we don't know. But it does highlight the fact that so often we see women being portrayed or, or being um, uh, victimised um, from, from Eve through to the woman in this story and through into the modern world. And that's actually something which involves our sin, the sin of society, not just personal sin, but, but collective sin in the way um, we perhaps... Um, show prejudice um, or partial treatment one way or another. Another power of the story is, is the very human realisation of her embarrassment and her degradation. Caught in this very personal situation, exposed morally and physically, um, and put to public shame. And against that we can imagine the sheer fear um, that she is experiencing as she's brought before the crowd. Um, the um, realisation that uh, she face, faces a terrifying prospect of being stoned to death. We've seen 
situations perhaps uh, on the television, on the news, of people who've uh, been subjected to a sort of summary um, brutality. Uh, it is horrifying the, the way that a crowd can turn on someone and we can imagine the experience that she has and the fears that are, are going through her mind. And there's perhaps this awful realisation that whatever led her into this sin suddenly seems so worthless compared with her life which is about to be forfeit. Whatever joys or thrills she may have anticipated, suddenly the horror of um, an awful ending to her life puts all that into the shade. There's one other aspect of the story which is interesting, and it may or may not be a deliberate allusion, but um, in this story we have an unfaithful woman brought for judgment. And it's a theme we find actually used a lot in the Old Testament, uh, particularly in the book of Hosea, the prophet, where Israel herself, when she uh, turns away from God to other gods, uh, is seen or is portrayed as an unfaithful wife. Again, the sort of idea of adultery uh, in the turning away from God. So perhaps in a way this story is being used by John as a motif to represent both unfaithful Israel and at times the unfaithful church, when the church has not been close to God and, and followed um, her spouse, if you like, Christ her spouse. That's a little comfort to the woman in her own situation. But perhaps it's a broader truth about the story. It's a motif of our collective and individual unfaithfulness to God. In all the um, impact of the story, there's something else which is noticeable when we think about our understanding um, in the Christian life of sin and forgiveness. Because we understand the importance of confessing our sin, recognising when we've gone wrong, and turning to God in penitence and faith. That's very much a theme of this period of Lent and indeed at every Eucharist and in our other services we take a moment to reconcile ourselves to God and to one another by confessing humbly and openly our wrongdoings. In this story there's actually no mention directly of her penitence. We can imagine she feels uh, guilty for what she's done and she feels sorrowful. There's no actual outward expression, uh, no confession of her sin um, uh, in the way that uh, we find in some other stories. Um, and yet I'm, I'm sure it's there. And we know that from the stories uh, in the scriptures as a whole, that that's a very important element uh, in our relationship with God is the owning up to our sin and the acceptance of our wrongdoing. So we tend to focus on that link between uh, penitence and God's forgiveness. Um, and that is reinforced, I think, amply elsewhere in other stories. But here, rather like the story of the prodigal son, when we hear of the father waiting at the gate for the son, even before perhaps the son realises his own wrongdoing, we have that sense of God reaching out to us, even in the depths of sin, even when we're not perhaps yet ready to confess and say sorry. The love is not withdrawn. Uh, God never hates us because of our sin, but is always there with open arms to welcome us back. So Lent is a sort of call to recognise um, our need for forgiveness. But I think also it's a time when we can understand that uh, however slow we are to recognise our faults, God is, as it were, there before us, ready to, to welcome us back. The story ends with Jesus' command, go and sin no more. Quite a challenge, of course, but uh, it's a very serious uh, point that he's making, that from now on her life is a journey and no doubt a struggle, uh, a struggle to overcome whatever temptations she was subject to before, a challenge day by day to take up her particular cross and to uh, turn her life around. And I think it's a very powerful message because... Uh, this Lent is a journey, our life is a journey, which we're invited to make um, despite ongoing challenges, very real challenges day to day and in our spiritual lives. So our calling is to make Lent a journey both with Christ and into the very heart and mind of Christ. And this is the integration I was alluding to right at the start, I think, about Lent being part of a wider journey, not a, a sort of wandering off into the, um, the scrublands uh, taking a month or two 
uh, away from our normal journey, but very much a part of the road that we travel day by day uh, and week by week. There has to be some integration. And that's not something we need to worry about, but something that we can be creative and very positive about uh, in our response to this, this precious time that the church gives us each year to call us back to Christ. Of course, we emphasise particular extra commit commitments, as our other reading would remind us, prayer, almsgiving and fasting uh, are all seen as, as central uh, things that we can work on during this period. And as we journey with Christ and see his own example and his own dedication, um, it's quite a challenge to look at these aspects of our lives. Many of us find prayer difficult at times. It can be dry. Uh, it can seem, in a sense, uh, pointless at times. It, it, it can feel difficult to find a discipline. So perhaps one way to look at it is, is not to spend, spend Lent necessarily in active prayer in the sense of speaking to God, but to use it very much as a time for listening. I'm conscious that so much we spend our time uh, talking to God or at God with our requests. Prayer is equally about the other side of the conversation, listening to God, um, being open to what may be said in the quiet. Um, you remember Elijah, who hears God uh, in, the, in the still, small voice, as it were, rather than the storm. Uh, opening our lives to that stillness uh, is a very powerful form and a very accessible form of, of daily prayer. Maybe on the walks, if you're able to enjoy those, uh, as the warm weather comes and uh, if you're able to get out during this, this time, then um, simply being open to the gift of God around us is, is a way of prayer. Um, as for almsgiving, well, they say that many of us have been fortunate enough during this pandemic to be saving on our expenditure, so there may be some extra money to, to give charitably, and of course there are many people who need that. Um, but that's not possible for everyone. Um, it's not appropriate for everyone. And almsgiving is more about giving of ourselves. It may be of talents or of time. One of the most precious things we can give is, is of our time. Um, using this Lent perhaps to reach out to others who are lonely, um, befriending, uh, making them aware that there is someone around to listen to them uh, is important too. And that's a form of, of almsgiving, very powerful form. And fasting, well, that self-denial, that, that discipline, that's the one that we often express in a, in a sort of token way um, through giving up chocolate or, or whatever it be. Um, but I think the importance there is the self-denial and the discipline that comes in the sense of equipping ourselves to fight a very real spiritual battle that, that goes on through the course of our lives. Going back to the woman in the story, she may have fallen into her sin because of um, a fault of her own, either perhaps carelessly allowing a situation to develop or indeed willfully um, knowing full well that she was doing wrong. And in either, in either way, she would be at fault. Of course, it's equally possible that she was a victim of coercion. We, we just don't know in that story. But if we assume for a moment that the story is talking about those who willfully or indeed carelessly fall into sin by their own fault, then we can see that this story is reminding us that Lent is a time to strengthen ourselves, to gird ourselves, as it were, to face challenges, to, to give ourselves the discipline to um, reject really the attractiveness of sin. Uh, St Thomas Aquinas um, has this idea uh, in his writing, which, which I think he gets from um, Aristotle, he gets a lot from Aristotle. Um, and, and this idea is that actually we don't we don't sort of choose sin as a deliberate wrong so much as um, fall short of the ideal by seeing something that looks attractive without realising the real good thing uh, beyond it, as it were. So it's rather like firing an arrow in his day, not hitting the target, but falling short. And the challenge for us is to be prepared to um, reach out to the real good and not to the illusory goods that, that may stand in our way. So we're invited to strengthen ourselves against the, the easy attractiveness of, of sin, as it, as it were. As many people know, the word Lent um, comes from the word for spring. And in this time of year, we're seeing darkness turning back into light. 
we're seeing warmth coming back to the earth, we're seeing life returning where it appeared to be dead in the garden and in the fields. And Lent really is uh, an invitation to share in that growth, that return to light, that return to life. And I commend it to you as a time of um, great excitement really, as we not only make the journey through these coming weeks, but actually, in a sense, add to the journey of our lives. It's not just about this journey to Easter. It's about the journey that we take through the rest of our lives. So I'd like to finish with a collect for Ash Wednesday, which reminds us of God's great love for all that he's made, and which can be an encouragement to us as we make this journey. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I wish you a very blessed Lent.